Thank you so much for tuning in to uh, American Heart Association's Have Faith in Heart. This segment is going to be amazing. I really encourage all churches, get your church members, tag them. I need you to share this. You want to get this information to your people because I promise you it would change their lives in the natural. So we know about the spiritual, but we need to really equip our people to be able to live life full and healthy. So I want you to stop what you're doing. I want you to call somebody, text somebody, text somebody share this with somebody but you want to tune in to the american heart association have faith in heart this information is going to transform your ministry hello everyone welcome to the have faith in heart panel discussion webinar i'm jean Losarge bono and i'm the executive director for the american heart association in west michigan we're excited to host a panel discussion today about the power of the faith-based community, in particular, the African-American churches on driving improved health through our most vulnerable communities. I'd like to thank our sponsor for the Have Faith and Heart program since 2017, Mercy Health. Without your sponsorship, we really wouldn't be able to do such critical programs as what we're doing. The American Heart Association is deeply concerned about the public health crisis that's facing our country right now. And our top priority regarding the coronavirus or COVID-19 is the health and well-being of all individuals and their families today, in the future, and beyond. This virus is impacting everyone, regardless of race, religion, age, and gender. And now the recent focus on racism and discrimination in the United States is demanding a frontline focus on the health disparities that impact people of color. With two public health threats ongoing, the coronavirus and then the impact of systemic racism, we're continuing our mission critical work in these challenging times, which is why I think this discussion today is so powerful. I'm excited to welcome Beverly Austin, the co-pastor for Bethel Empowerment Church and a board member for the West Michigan AHA board, India Manns, a community leader and also a board member for the West Michigan American Heart Association board. She's also the chair for the Have Faith and Heart First Ladies Committee. Dr. Karen Kennedy, she's a family physician and regional medical director with Mercy Health and Jocelyn Farmer, our Health Equity Manager, Diversity and Equity Marketing for the American Heart Association, an active church member, and our MC for today's panel discussion. I'm going to kick off with a brief statement from Nancy Brown, American Heart Association CEO, and then Chairman of the American Heart Association National Board, Bertram L. Scott. Like you, I am heartbroken by the tragedies that have taken place across our country. The memories of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and far too many others remain with us, and our hearts go out to everyone, everywhere, who is grieving and searching for justice. The American Heart Association denounces senseless acts of racial violence against individuals and unnecessary violence in our communities. As a nonprofit healthcare organization, we are taking a stand on social justice issues because it's the right thing to do and because there is scientific evidence supporting the link between social justice and health equity. Racial disparities in heart disease, stroke, and other chronic conditions exist and are well documented. African Americans are also more likely to be uninsured. There is also scientific evidence that African Americans' physical and mental health is negatively impacted by the inequities that exist. Add this to the fact that in the midst of a global pandemic and given barriers to health that exist, African Americans and other people of color are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The American Heart Association has championed health equity for all people for nearly a century, and we are more determined than ever to eliminate racial and class disparities. We will redouble our commitment to overcoming barriers to health and to addressing social inequalities. 
We must stand together as a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. That is our mission, our contribution to a more equitable society. People are counting on us like never before. We will listen. We will drive change. We will be relentless. Thank you for your support and thank you for listening. So Jocelyn, I'd love you to kick off the panel discussion today. Thank you, Jean, and good morning, everyone. Truly, I'm excited to be here today with the American Heart Association staff, but of course, our esteemed panelists as well. And I had the opportunity of being your MC and talking to you a little bit more about those social determinants of health. Beverly, the title of our wonderful seminar is The Power of the Churches to Build Healthier Lives. Can you tell us why the churches are so important and a, and a trusted source in invested in building healthier lives, not only for their members, but the community at large? But I just want to say this is really a great opportunity also. I love everything that the American Heart Association is doing for the community. So thank you for having me. Um, but the church is uh, the church is the hub for the community. And it's one of the, the greatest places. I remember back in the day, the church is where they did everything. They went to the church for health, for politics, for social justice, for everything. And so the church is still that hub where you go to for direction and information. So right now during this time, the church is real still a beacon of light. It's a beacon to go to, to try to sift through some of uh, the, 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 uh, the myriad of information that we're getting, that is a lot of it is conflicting. And so what we are responsible to do is we've had to up our responsibility to make sure we're staying in tune with the news, we're staying in tune with the CDC, so that we are then communicating correct information to our congregation. And so as a church, we're also making sure that we are a center to make sure that people are getting fed, uh, to make sure they're getting information, and to make sure that we're staying connected with all of the resources that are in our city so that we can also be a place where people can come to ask questions, but that we have sound information to give them. Awesome. Thank you, Verily. Can you give maybe a, some examples of how the church influences that well-being, you know, as it pertains to family, finances, and even mental health? Because sometimes I think mental health is left off of the table. What are your thoughts? Well, pre-COVID, um, again, a, a great partnership with the American Heart Association. So pre-COVID, um, uh, American Heart Association has helped provide resources for us to give information to our congregations. And that's one of the key things with um, the African-American community um, and all of the disparities is having people who can help break down a lot. Of, there's a lot of information given, but a lot of it that, that we just don't understand or quite know, what does all this mean? Can you give it to me in layman's terms. And so with a partnership with the American Heart Association and having access to doctors like Dr. Kennedy who come in to various programs that we have and give this information to the African American community in terms that we can understand. The biggest key that we try to make sure that our people know is that you can take charge of your health. You have the power to own your health, to know what's going on, to ask more questions, to go get more information. And so I'm so glad that as a church, we've been able to be a source partnering with other organizations to make sure that people are getting the information that they need and making sure that information is accurate and again, having access. There's so many resources, but many times our communities don't know about those resources to have access uh, to equal resources that exist in our community. And so we make sure that we are aware that we're plugged in and we make sure that the African American community gets plugged into those resources also and that we're able to then plug into other places to be advocates for them if things are not going the way they should. Absolutely. Once again, thank you, Beverly. We appreciate the work that you do and also the passion that you have. I can definitely see the passion. So thank you. I'm going to move on to our next panelist, but uh, Beverly, I will reserve the right to possibly come back <laughs> and ask you another question. <laughs> thank you again. Uh, so our next panelist is India. So um, India, you have been very passionate about closing the gaps and disparities 
of Health as both as a board member and a community leader. So thank you for, for your service as our board member. What do you feel is so important to drive health messaging through the churches right now during this COVID uh, pandemic? Well, I'd like to thank the American Heart Association, Gene, and you as well for responding when I brought this um, to Gene to say that now is the time. Uh, with COVID ravaging um, our community as it has uh, in the spring, winter, spring, however you want to call it, um, there is anticipation that it will come back. Although it has not technically left, there is concern about the rate in which it will come back in the fall. So that puts us back as target number one. And so right now with uh, the warmer weather and uh, a few months before technically flu season starts, which um, they say technically uh, flu season starts in, in October, there is time to get out to walk, to do uh, diet changes, to make small um, changes that may impact uh, what happens in the fall. So to bring some of those numbers down, be it high blood pressure, if you are teetering on diabetes or different things like that, that would make you more prone to um, the COVID. Um, I think it's very important to take time now to try to work on those things, to uh, boost the immune system, uh, whatever can be done. And I'm sure Dr. Kennedy can speak more to that, but we only have a few months. And I think it's very imperative that we take whatever action we can at this time to increase um, a better outcome uh, for this next go round. Thank you, um, India. And um, certainly your points are well received um, from a, a community perspective, but also from an AHA perspective as well. Uh, we know also that some of our community members are actually afraid even if they are experiencing the warning signs of heart disease and stroke, and I won't steal Dr. Kennedy's thunder, but they are afraid to even go to an emergency room because of the coronavirus as well. So um, another quick question for you, India. I, I learned this morning that you play a very pivotal role in the local market and the First Lady's initiative as it pertains to have faith and heart. So can you share with us, um, not even before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, how important is it for the first ladies to be involved? How do, how do they make that difference? Well, I think um, that when there is crisis or when there is concern, it often goes through our churches. We take that to the pastor, we take it to the first lady, uh, we take our concerns because we consider the information coming from the church a reliable source. So uh, with some of the history of things that has happened in the medical field and some of the distrust that African-Americans have with the medical field, coming through, pushing that information through the church, it's coming from a reliable source. And I believe that people are more likely to hear it and to take action on it. So, you know, the fact that we would take time to, um, to put this information together, to give it to the source where we know that it will be heard is extremely important. And that particularly now is why I'm pushing some action around uh, the anticipation of uh, the return of the uh, COVID virus this fall right. and how important it is that we get that information out and ask the congregation to do what they can to improve their chances for a better outcome. Thank you, um, India, and, and absolutely that, that has been a challenge and will be a challenge, but the one thing I will say, just from a faith-based perspective myself and being very active within my own church, the churches have, we've been there, you know, we're still there, we're encouraging, we're empowering, and it's difficult to do that because we know we're used to gathering together. So even getting used to maybe not being within the church together, we still come together. And we still have individuals like you and everyone on the panel who we're making sure that we're, we're here for one another. And um, once we emerge from this pandemic, we'll be stronger for it because we, we still believe that the faith-based organization is a cornerstone of the Black community. So thank you, um, India, and I'm sure we'll have a few questions coming for you as well. 
Uh, Dr. Kennedy, I have a question for you. Historically excluded communities have been hit particularly hard by coronavirus. African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, and Native people, and, and also those in the rural areas. So it's not just um, race, it's also geography as well. We know that they're experiencing higher rates of disease or, or severe comp complications and even death. Can you talk to us a little bit about that negative impact we're seeing to communities across Michigan and in West Michigan? What we're seeing now is not new. There's just a flashlight on everything that's happening in our communities right now. The African-American, Latino, First Nations communities, um, vulnerable populations. Uh, the things that we're seeing, which I'll get to in a minute, are not new, but they're exacerbated because of this virus. Um, that is a bad thing, but it's also a good thing in that now people have to truly pay attention to what's happening. You can't ignore it. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing, as India alluded to, are um, people who are much more at risk for COVID and uh, we, we really need to work with the risk factors that they have in order to help prevent it in the future. For example, um, heart disease, obesity, uh, COPD, which is known as uh, either emphysema or chronic bronchitis. A lot of times that's caused by smoking. It's caused by other things too, but mostly smoking. Asthma, Asthma. cancer, cancer. Um, things of that nature. Um, when you have those risk factors and in these communities, you tend to find, oh, and diabetes, I can't forget about that. When you find these um, disease states in higher numbers in these communities, those communities are gonna be much more at risk of COVID. Um, in Michigan, uh, at one point, I think it's still the same, about 30% of the positives of COVID were Latino, and about 40% across the state were African-American. Now, if we were 40% at African-American state, maybe that would make sense. But we make up maybe 15% of the state, so why are 40% of us being hit? And I can go on and on with the numbers, but uh, this is why in our medical community, we're trying to focus on those risk factors to help and decrease the risk of COVID. Even if COVID never happened, we'd be working on it, but we need to focus on it even more now. And we can't do it alone. So I'm glad to see that we're working with the church community as usual and with community leaders and the American Heart Association to try and do this. It's impossible to do just as a medical community because we're not always a trusted voice. Um, sometimes we are, um, we, you, you guys are even much more so. So I'm glad that we're talking about this today. So uh, Dr. Kennedy, thank you um, so, you know, so much for giving us the, you know, that medical background because once again, we, we, we know that uh, so many of the vulnerable communities are being affected disproportionately. So my next question for you is the American Heart Association, we're advocating for a program called our Life Simple 7, which addresses those risk factors for heart disease and stroke, like high blood pressure, you know, cholesterol, healthy eating, you know, all the norm, the, the, the usual suspects, right? So do, do you feel that those same values hold true? Should we still be addressing those Life Simple 7? Should we be adding something? How can we prioritize that? Oh, I love Life Simple 7. They are so simple in nature, but many people may not necessarily find it simple to do. So through forums such as this, hopefully it'll be a little bit easier. But yes, it, it definitely um, holds true uh, during this COVID uh, season. So for example, um, starting off with the seven, um, if you do smoke, I don't think there's anyone walking the planet <laughs> that doesn't know that stopping smoking can help and decrease your risk for uh, uh, lung cancer, um, oral cancers, meaning mouth cancers, heart disease, and other things as well. So stopping smoking can decrease your risk of respiratory type illnesses. And COVID does hit the respiratory, um, you know, the, lung, um, uh, the lungs. Uh, even so much more in, in, in these patients than others. So stopping smoking would be awesome. Um, eating better. So everyone says to eat better, but what does that really mean? Um, that's something I could go on all day about too. But one big thing I'm working on with my patients is maybe decreasing the amount of white starchy foods that you eat, for example. Um, white bread, white rice, white potatoes, French fries. And I know I'm killing everyone by saying all this, but these are the things that can put you more at risk for diabetes, heart disease, 
um, you gain weight easier this way. Try replacing some of those foods with um, vegetables and, um, and other healthier foods. Uh, try to avoid pop um, uh, and drink more water or other things that don't have as much sugar. Um, get active. A lot of times people don't know what that means, but getting active means, according to the Centers of Disease Control, the CDC, about 30 minutes every other day of something that gets the heart rate up to the point where you're kind of breathy if you had to talk to someone. Walking is easy if you want to do that. Taking the stairs. If you can't do that, there are certain things that you can do sitting in your chair as well. You may want to talk to your physician or um, you know, a trusted uh, person about that as well. Um, losing weight. So uh, about three quarters of the United States is either overweight or obese. We don't need everyone to be stick thin, but just uh, healthy enough and, and lose weight enough to try and avoid certain risk factors. Um, there are certain um, areas of the American Heart Association website where you can find out uh, what your numbers should be. And you can talk to a trusted professional about that as well. Managing your blood pressure. Absolutely. Um, the eating habits, stopping smoking, losing weight can all help with that as well. Proper diet, uh, taking pills is an option. It's not always the only thing we can do. And sometimes I get people off medication. You know, medications can be expensive. So let's, let's work on the blood pressure in different ways if we have to. Controlling cholesterol all goes along, along with everything else that I, uh, that I mentioned. Avoiding a lot of fried foods, uh, especially, can help. And then reducing blood sugar. Uh, I alluded to that a little while ago in talking about eating habits. Exercise helps to decrease the sugar too. So those are all of the things in the Life's Simple 7. And they hold true now, they held true before, and they'll hold true in the future. So thanks for presenting that through the Heart Association. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for giving us that great overview of Life Simple 7. And also thank you for reminding us of the things we need to do. You know, we know hearing it sometimes is, is difficult because some of those things we enjoy, but to get a start, um, maybe you, you just don't do it all at once. But, you know, to your point, replace some of the, the, the things that we know are not good for our health and get started, not tomorrow, but today. So thank you again. Um, all right, so uh, Beverly, as promised, I have another question um, for you. As a pastor for Bethel Empowerment Center, you have personally seen how devastating chronic health conditions and now a pandemic affect our lives uh, and the lives of the church members. Tell us a little bit about that experience. For, for example, how has your church adapted to keeping your congregation safe and healthy? And are you still able to feed your congregation spiritually and help with their physical well-being? That's a fantastic question. Um, so what I love about this whole program is that it's having faith in heart. So faith is the driving force, is the foundation, is the pillar that our kingdom teaching is built upon. And so that's one of the key things through this pandemic that we have been very intentional of instilling into our people is first and foremost, faith in God. And so with this faith in God, we know that God wants you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So we're talking about the tangibles, the emotional, the physical uh, part of you. And so we, are, we don't want our people to be so spiritual that they are no earthly good. And so we have been intentional about balancing this information through online teachings. And so for all of this pandemic, we have to push hard online with our online presence. And so we've done that. We've connected with our people uh, two to three times a week. But here's the crazy thing is that I don't want to, we don't want to teach our people just uh, habits to get through the pandemic. We are using this time to teach them habits for life. And so I think it's amazing that we're going so hard after washing our hands when I think that's something we should have been doing already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just amazing to me the things that like a Dr. Kennedy and the different programs that the AHA has had have been trying to get people to do for just regular day-to-day -day living. And now we're doing it to, to ward COVID. But we are trying to teach our people habits for living, habits for healthy spiritual and healthy natural living. And so we've done that mainly through our online presence. We've broken our, our, our uh, congregation up into groups. So I do some things with the women. My husband does something with the 
coming in, but we can't forget our kids. And so getting the kids to start doing healthy things now also will help them avoid some of the stuff we're going through. So our biggest thing is pushing their minds beyond COVID to develop healthy habits for living. So that's been what we're doing. Right. You know, such an excellent answer. And, you know, to your point about the role that um, even our, our ministers, our, our auxiliaries, um, just the power of prayer plays, I had the opportunity to, to read a, a, a faith-based study, um, actually called the faith study. And that study uh, had about 343 uh, black and uh, black males and females within the study. And that was across 32 churches in New York. And as a result, they did see a drop in systolic pressure, which we know that definitely um, can, came about because of healthy behaviors. But when surveying those individuals who completed in the cohort study, it was found that it was because they had the spiritual support. They had, the, the, the church had healthy programs they were participating in. There was an expectation to, to, to be healthy, to your point, to be of service. Um, and, and and that rings true that being a service, we will need you in, in the service after the pandemic. Because um, we're going to say after, we're going to believe in that. That's that faith you talked about, right? So yeah. uh, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, that, that, that great answer to those two questions. Thank you so much for joining us for the first segment of our discussion on the power of the churches to impact our community's health. I'd like to thank Beverly Austin, India Manns, Dr. Karen Kennedy, and Jocelyn Farmer for leading this amazing discussion today. The American Heart Association has been a leader for nearly a century in advocating for health equity, so we're excited for the willingness of these extraordinary community leaders to lead this critical discussion. We'll continue this discussion in segment two with more dialogue around social determinants of health, the upcoming flu season, and the mental health and well being of our underserved communities. We hope you join us for segment two. Thanks so much again. Take care and be well.